It's quite easy to see how, for instance, the practice of Japan bashing in the West can be fueled by appeals to the menacing and sinister aspects of Japanese culture as employed by government spokespersons, or how the age-old appeal to the yellow peril might be mobilized for use in discussions in Washington or New York or London of ongoing problems with Korea, North or and South Korea, or China. The opposite is true, but it is true, in the practice throughout Asia and Africa of Occidentalism, in other words, talking about the West as if it was one thing and uh, one thing only, turning the West into a monolithic category that is supposed to express hostility to non-white, non-European and non-Christian civilizations. Perhaps because he's more interested in policy prescription than he is either in history or the careful analysis of cultural formations. Huntington, in my opinion, is quite misleading in what he says and how he puts things. A great deal of his, and the reason one takes time with him at all, I mean, it's a 17-page document, but it's A, it's very influential, and B, he, he does represent a kind of important sector of opinion uh, in this country, and I think in that respect he's symptomatic uh, and therefore worth a good deal of attention. A great deal of his argument depends on, not on direct contact with an understanding and knowledge of languages of, but rather second and third hand opinion that really scans the enormous advances in our concrete and theoretical understanding of how cultures work, how they change, how they are. Cultures are not simply, you know, like, uh, you know, an inert object, but they're dynamic, constantly changing things. And we know now a great deal more about how they work and how they can be grasped and appreh apprehended. A brief look at the peoples and opinions, uh, the people and opinions he quotes, suggests that rather than scholarship or theory about cultures, his main sources are journalism and popular demagoguery. When you draw on tendentious publicists, Scholars and journalists like Charles Krauthammer, who's cited as an authority on world civilization, or Bernard Lewis, who's cited as an authority, well, it doesn't really matter what he's cited as an authority on. Uh, you, you already, in my opinion, prejudice the argument in favor of conflict and polemic rather than in favor of true understanding and the kind of cooperation between peoples that our planet needs. Huntington's authorities are not the cultures themselves, therefore, but a small handful of authorities, or pseudo-authorities, picked by him because, in fact, they emphasize the latent belligerency in one or another statement by one or another so-called spokesman for about that culture. The giveaway for me is the title of his essay, which nobody has commented on, I think, The, the Clash of Civilizations, which is not his phrase, but Bernard Lewis's phrase. On the last page of Lewis's essay entitled The Roots of Muslim Rage, and Muslims are always talked about in terms of rage and madness and insecurity and uh, all these other things. Uh, an article that appeared in the uh, Atlantic Monthly in September of 1990, Lewis speaks about his diagnosis of the current problem with the Islamic world. I quote, it should by now be clear that we are facing a mood and a movement in Islam, that is, far transcending the level of issues and policies and the governments that pursue them. In other words, we're really not talking about the real world at all. This is no less than a clash of civilizations. The perhaps irrational but surely historic reactions of an ancient rival against our Judeo-Christian heritage, our secular present, and the worldwide expansion of both. It is crucially important that we, on our side, should not be provoked into an equally historic but also equally irrational reaction against that rival. Now, I don't want to spend too much time discussing the lamentable features of Lewis's article. I've described his methods elsewhere, the lazy generalizations, the reckless distortions of history, the wholesale demotion of civilizations into categories like irrational, enraged, so on and so forth. 
Few people today with any sense would want to volunteer such sweeping characterizations as the one advanced by Lewis about a billion Muslims whom he calls irrational and enraged. Muslims who are scattered through at least five continents, dozens of different languages and traditions as well as histories. Of them all, he says that they're all enraged at Western modernity, as if a billion people were only one person sitting in a chair opposite Lewis, sort of frothing at the mouth. <laughs> and Western civilization itself was no more complicated a matter than a simple declarative sentence. Eh? But I, what I do want to stress is, first of all, how Huntington has picked up from Lewis the notion that civilizations are monolithic and homogeneous. And second, again from Lewis, he, how he assumes the unchanging character of the duality between us and them. In other words, I think it's absolutely imperative to stress that like Bernard Lewis, Huntington does not write neutral, descriptive, objective prose, but is himself a polemicist whose rhetoric not only depends heavily on prior arguments about a war of all against all, but in effect perpetuates the war. Far from being an arbiter between civilizations, therefore, such people as Huntington are partisans, advocates of one civilization over all the others. Like Lewis, Huntington defines Islamic civilization reductively, as if what most matters about it is its supposed anti-Westernism, as if every Muslim in the world wakes up every morning and feels very anti-Western. <laughs> you can see how ridiculous this is, but this is language that is taken seriously. People puff on their pipes, they nod their heads, they, they get foundation grants, they write books. There's a, uh, for his part, Lewis tries to give a set of reasons for his definition that Islam has never modernized that it never separated between church and state, that, has it been, that it has been incapable of understanding other civilizations. These are Lewis's uh, reasons. But Huntington doesn't even bother with them. For him, Islam, Confucianism, and the other five or six civilizations that would include Hindu civilizations, Japanese, Slavic, Orthodox, Latin American, and African, as well, of course, as the West. <laughs> that all of these still exist, and are separate from each other, and consequently potentially in a conflict which he wants to manage, not resolve, that's the point. He writes as a crisis manager, not as a student of civilization, nor as a reconciler between them. At the core of his essay, and this is what has made it strike so responsive, a chord among post-Cold War policymakers, is this sense of cutting through a lot of unnecessary detail, of masses of scholarship, and huge amounts of experience, and boiling all of them down to a couple of catchy, easy to quote and remember ideas which are then passed off as pragmatic, practical, practical, sensible, and clear. But is this the best way to understand the world we live in? Is it wise, as an intellectual and a scholarly expert, to produce a simplified map of the world that simply overlooks politics and history entirely? I mean, Every member of a civilization is supposed to be intent only upon his civilization or her civilization and doesn't think about, you know, political parties, about struggles for power, about recent history, and all of that's irrelevant. The main thing is to fight the West, so Huntington used to say. And then takes this idea and hands it over to generals and civilian lawmakers as a prescription first for comprehending and then for acting in the world. Doesn't this method, in effect, prolong and deepen conflict? What does it do to minimize civilizational conflict? Do we want the class of civilizations? Is that really what we want in the end? And Huntington seems to think, yes, that is what we want. And doesn't this thesis mobilize nationalist passions and therefore nationalist murderousness? Shouldn't we ask the question, why is one doing this sort of thing? to understand or to act, to mitigate or to aggravate the likelihood of conflict. I would want to begin 
to survey the world situation by commenting on how prevalent it has become for people to speak out now in the name of large and, in my opinion, undesirably vague and manipulable abstractions like the West or Japanese culture or Slavic culture or Islam or Confucianism, labels that collapse religions, races, and ethnicities into ideologies that are considerably more unpleasant and provocative than 19th century scholars like Gobineau and Renan did 150 years ago. Strange as it may seem though, these examples which, are, which dot the media and even scholarly discourse today, these examples of group psychology run completely amok are not new and they're certainly not edifying at all. They occur in times of deep insecurity, that is, when people seem particularly close to and thrust upon each other, peoples of different civilizations. The result either of expansion, war, imperialism, or migration. I mean, if you think about France today, France is no longer made up exclusively of Frenchmen with names like Dupont and Chirac, for that matter. They're like, they're, several hundred thousand, close to two million Muslims in France today. So you can't speak of Fra France in the same old way. It's changed. And this sudden appearance of new, um, of new nationalities, new identities in the midst of what used to be or was thought of as homogenous identities produces an effect of sudden and unprecedented change. And this, of course, exacerbates the language of group identity. Let me give a couple of examples to illustrate what I mean from history. The language of group identity, when people start seriously to talk about themselves as French or British in a kind of aggravated, what we would call chauvinistic or even xenophobic way, makes its particularly strident appearance from the middle to the end of the 19th century as the culmination of decades of international competition between the great European and American powers for territories in Africa and Asia. In the battle for what Conrad called the empty spaces of Africa, the dark continent, France and Britain as well as Germany and Belgium resort not only to force but to a whole slew of theories and rhetorics for justifying their plunder in Africa. Perhaps the most famous of such devices is the French concept of civilizing mission, mission civilisatrice, a notion underlying which is the idea that some races and cultures have a higher aim in life than others. This gives the more powerful, the more developed, the more civilized the right, therefore, to colonize others, not in the name of brute force or raw plunder, both of which are standard components of the exercise, of course. That's why they were there in the first place. But in the name of a noble ideal, so you could do the killing, you could take the plunder, slave labor, etc. But at the same time say you're really doing it for their good because we have a mission to civilize the native. Conrad's most famous story, Heart of Darkness, is an ironic, even terrifying enactment of this thesis that, as his narrator Marlowe puts it, the conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have slightly Oh, sorry, who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. What redeems it is the idea, an idea at the back of it, not a sentimental pretense, but an idea, and an unselfish belief in the idea, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. Now, in response to this kind of logic, two things occur. One is that competing powers, the French, the British, and the others, invent their own theory of cultural or civilizational destiny in order to justify their actions abroad and to distinguish themselves from the others who are doing the same thing. Britain had a theory like that, Germany had one, Belgium had one, and of course, in the concept of manifest destiny, the United States had one too, as an imperial power in the 19th century. These redeeming ideas dignify the practice of competition and class whose real purpose, as Conrad quite accurately saw, was power, conquest, self-aggrandizement, treasure, and unrestrained self-pride. I would go so far as to say 
that what we today call the rhetoric of identity, by which a member of one ethnic or religious or national or cultural group puts that group at the center of the world, derives from that period of imperial competition at the end of the 19th century. And this, in turn, provokes the concept of worlds at war, or civilizations at war, that quite obviously is the heart of Huntington's article. It received its most frightening application in H.G. Wells's fable, The War of the Worlds, which, one recalls, expands the concept to include a battle between this world and a distant interplanetary one. In the related fields of political economy, geography, anthropology, and historiography, the theory that each world is self-enclosed has its own boundaries and special territories applied to the world map, to the structure of civilizations, to the notion that each race and each civilization has a special destiny, has a special psychology, has a special ethos. All of these ideas, almost without exception, are based not on the harmony, but on the conflict or clash between worlds. You see it in the works of Gustave Le Bon, the French group psychologist, who wrote a famous book called The World in Revolt, and in such relatively forgotten works as F.S. Marvin's Western Races and the World, published in 1922, and in Pitt Rivers' The Clash of Culture and the Contact of Races, 1927. So this is all background to Huntington. The second thing that happens is that, as Huntington himself concedes, the lesser people, the people who are the objects of the imperial gaze respond by resisting their forcible manipulation and settlement. We now know that active primary resistance to the white man began the moment he set foot in places like Algeria, East Africa, India, and elsewhere. Later, primary resistance, throwing spears, fighting battles, and so on, was succeeded by secondary resistance the organization of political and cultural movements determined to achieve independence and liberation from imperial control. At precisely the moment in the 19th century that among the European and American powers, a rhetoric of civilizational self-justification begins to be widespread, a responding rhetoric among the colonized people develops, one that speaks in terms of African or Asian or Arab unity, independence self-determination. In India, for example, the Congress Party was organized in 1880 and by the turn of the century had convinced the Indian elite that only by supporting Indian languages, Indian industry, Indian commerce could political freedom come. These are ours and ours alone, runs the argument, and only by supporting our civilization against theirs, the British. Note the us versus them construction here. Only then can we stand firmly on our own. One finds a similar logic at work during the Meiji period in modern Japan. Something like this rhetoric of belonging is also lodged at the heart of each independence movement's nationalism and it achieved the result shortly after World War II, not only of dismantling the classical empires, but of winning independence for dozens of countries thereafter. India, Indonesia, most of the Arab world, Indo Indochina, Algeria, Kenya, all these emerged between 1945 and 1965 onto the world scene, sometimes peacefully, sometimes as the effect of internal developments, as in the Japanese instance, and as the result of ugly colonial wars, or wars as they were called, of national liberation. Now, in both the colonial and post-colonial context, therefore, rhetorics of general cultural or civilizational identity went in two potential directions. One, a utopian line that insisted on an overall pattern of integration and harmony between all peoples. No more empires, let us all be brothers and sisters together, first as Africans, then as Asians, then as citizens of the world community. That was one line. The other was a line that suggested as how all civilizations were so specific and jealous, monotheistic in effect, as to reject and war against all the others. Among instances of the first or utopian line are the language and the institutions of the United Nations. 
founded in the aftermath of World War II. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the institution today. And the subsequent development out of that of various attempts at world government predicated on coexistence, voluntary limitations of sovereignty, integration of peoples and cultures harmoniously. Among the second are the theory and practice of the Cold War. And more recently, the idea that the clash of civilizations is, if not a necessity for a world of so many different parts, then a certainty. That's hunting. According to this, cultures and civilizations are basically separated from each other. I don't want to be invidious here and to just talk only about attitudes like Huntington's in the West, because in the Islamic world, for example, there's been a resurgence of rhetorics and movements stressing the in inimicability of Islam with the West. Just as in Africa, Europe, Asia, movements have appeared that stress the need for excluding designated others as undesirable. Uh, former Yugoslavia is a, a, a landscape of of desolation as a result of that kind of logic. White apartheid in South Africa was such a movement too. The point of this short cultural history of the idea of the class of civilizations is that people like Huntington are products of that history and are shaped in their writings by it. Moreover, the language describing the clash is laced with considerations of power. The powerful use it to protect what they have, what they do, the powerless or less powerful use it to achieve parity, independence, or a comparative advantage with regard to the dominant power. Thus, to build a conceptual framework around the notion of us versus them is, in effect, to pretend that the principal consideration is epistemological and natural. Our civilization is known and accepted. Theirs is different and strange. Whereas, in fact, I would want to argue the framework separating us from them is constructed, is situational, is belligerent, is designed to prolong conflict. Within each civilizational camp, we will notice, there are official representatives of the culture or civilization who make themselves into its mouthpiece. You know, people like William Bennett is going around telling us what our virtues really are. I mean, I didn't vote for Bennett, I didn't appoint him to that, but that function seems to exist now at proliferating as a function within cultures and countries. In each civilizational camp, we will notice, there are official representatives of the culture or civilization who make themselves into its mouthpiece. You know, people like William Bennett is going around telling us what our virtues really are. I mean, I didn't vote for Bennett, I didn't appoint him to that, but that function seems to exist now at proliferating as a function within cultures and countries. People who appoint themselves the spokesmen of what our real values and traditions are, whose role is to, or well, they assign themselves the role of articulating our essence. But this always requires a, a considerable amount of compression, exaggeration, and reduction. So on the first and the most immediate level then, statements about what our culture or civilization is, or ought to be, necessarily involve a contest over the definition. If you're going to say ours, you have to be able to say what we are, how do we define ourselves. This is certainly true of Huntington, who writes his essay at a time in the U.S. when a great deal of turmoil has been occurring around the very definition of Western civilization. I would say this is the worst possible time to venture large generalizations about Western civilizations, because that's exactly what's being debated. What is Western civilization? Recall, for example, that in this country, many college campuses have been shaken during the past 20 years over what the canon of Western civilization was, what books should be taught, which ones read, not read, and so on. Places like Stanford, I'm sure Wisconsin as well, Columbia, every place you could think of debated the issue, not simply as a matter of academic concern, but because the definition of the West and consequently of America were at stake. 
Anyone who has the slightest understanding of how cultures work knows that defining that culture, or that civilization, saying what it is for members, is always a major democratic contest. There are always canonical authorities to be selected and regularly revised, debated, we selected, or dismissed. There are ideas of good and evil, ideas of value to be specified, discussed, and settled, or not, as the case may be. Moreover, each culture defines its enemies, what stands beyond it and threatens it. For the Greeks, for instance, beginning with Herodotus, anyone who didn't speak Greek was automatically a barbarian, an other to be despised and fought against. In every society, the official culture is that of priests, academies, and the state. It provides, all of these provide definitions of patriotism, loyalty, boundaries, and belonging. It is this official culture that speaks in the name of the whole, that tries to express the general will, that the general idea which inclusively holds in the official past, the founding fathers, the texts, the pantheon of heroes and villains, and excludes what is foreign or different or undesirable or inferior. From it come the definitions of what may or may not be said, those prohibitions that are necessary to any culture if it is to have authority. It's also true that in addition to the mainstream or official or canonical culture and civilization, there are always dissenting, and this Huntington has no idea about it, there are always dissenting, alternative, unorthodox, heterodox cultures within civilizational camps like Islam or the West or Japan that contain many anti-authoritarian strains in them in competition with the official culture. These can be called the counterculture that old Newt Gingrich is always bothering on about without ever showing any sign of understanding it. <laughs> the counterculture which is an ensemble of practices associated with different kinds, various kinds of outsiders, the poor, immigrants, Artistics, uh, artistic bohemians, workers, rebels, artists. From the counterculture comes the critique of authority and attacks on what is official and orthodox. The great contemporary Arab poet Adonis has written a massive account of the relationship between orthodoxy and heterodoxy in Arab Islamic culture. I'm sure Bernard Lewis never read it. Probably doesn't exist. <clears throat> and certainly Huntington. Uh, has no conception of it. And, and Adonis has shown the constant dialectic within the world of Islam between the official and the unofficial. No culture, is, in my opinion, is understandable without some sense of this ever-present source of creative provocation from the unofficial to the official. To disregard the sense of restlessness within each culture and to assume that there's culture and identity is to miss what is vital in culture. In the United States, the debate about what is American has gone through a large number of, and of transformations and sometimes dramatic shifts. As I was growing up, for example, in the Middle East, I used to look at, Ameri at Western films which depicted Native Americans as devils to be destroyed or tamed. They were called Red Indians. And insofar as they had any function in the culture at large, it was to be a foil to the advancing course of white civilization. Today, this has changed completely. Native Americans are seen as victims, not villains, of the country's Western progress. There's even been a change, even more dramatic change, perhaps, in the South of Columbus. There are even more dramatic reversals in the depiction of, of African Americans and of women. Toni Morrison has noted how it is that in classic American literature, there's an obsession with whiteness. Moby Dick, Arthur Gordon Pym. Yet she says the major male and white writers of the 20th, 19th and 20th centuries, men who shaped the canon of what we have known as American literature, created their works by using whiteness as a way of avoiding, curtaining off, rendering invisible the African, the black African presence in the midst of the society. The very fact that Toni Morrison writes her novels and criticism with such success and brilliance now underscores the extent of the change 
from the world of Melville and Hemingway to that of Du Bois, Baldwin, Langston Hughes, and Toni Morrison. Which vision is the real America? And who can lay claim to represent and define it? The question is a complex and deeply interesting one, but it can't be settled by reducing the whole matter to a few cliches. A recent view of the difficulties involved in cultural contests whose object is the definition of a civilization can be found in Arthur Schlesinger's book, The Disuniting of America, and I think it should be read as a kind of counterpoint to Huntington's essay. As a mainstream historian, Schlesinger is troubled by the fact that emergent and immigrant groups in the U.S. have disputed the official unitary fable of America as it used to be represented by the great classical historians of the country, men like Bancroft and Henry Adams and so on. They want the writing of history to reflect not only in America these new groups, not only in America want history to reflect not only in America that was conceived of and ruled by patricians and landowners, but in America in which slaves, servants, laborers, and poor immigrants played an important but as yet unacknowledged role. The narratives of such people, silenced by the great discourses whose source was Washington, the great industrial fortunes of the Middle West, the investment banks of New York, the universities of New England, have come now to disrupt the slow progress and unruffled serenity of the official stories. The new groups, the immigrants, the women, the, uh, the, uh, the, the eccentrics, ask questions interject the experiences of social unfortunates and make the claims of frankly lesser peoples, women, Asian, African Americans, various other minorities, sexual as well as ethnic. Whether or not one agrees with Schlesinger, there is no disagreeing with his underlying thesis that the writing of history is the royal road to the definition of a country and of a civilization, that the identity of a society is in large part a function of historical interpretation which is fraught unendingly with claims and counterclaims. There's a similar debate about definitions inside the Islamic world, and this too, Huntington has no conception of. And his article just glosses over it as if it doesn't exist. Everybody knows what Islam is, everybody knows what the West is, everybody knows what Slavic culture is. Whereas in fact, I think a lot of people don't know and are asking questions and saying, which is the version we want? And this is especially true, I think, within the Islamic world, which is in the often hysterical outcry about the threat of Islam in the West, about Islamic fundamentalism and terrorism, one encounters so often in the Western media and in the mouths of politicians like President Clinton, who goes to the Middle East and gives speeches only about terrorism and violence, completely ignoring the fact that hundreds of thousands of millions of people are undergoing violence, injustice, poverty, suffering, that provokes people. And of course the question is not that there is terrorism, but why there isn't more of it, given the incredible, uh, the, un the incredible inequalities that exist there. But no, all we pay attention to is, Western fundam uh, is Islamic fundamentalism. And, and there really is, by the way, I, I mentioned it earlier, and you laughed, and perhaps one should laugh, but there is something called a fundamentalism project for which hundreds of thousands of dollars have been appropriated uh, by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, by the University of Chicago, and all they do is sit around and read these things and say, oh, well, it's terrible fundamentalism, it's on. So, <laughs> but what is forgotten and overlooked is the fact that like every other major world civilization, Islam contains within it an astonishing variety of currents and countercurrents, most of them undiscerned by tendentious Orientalist scholars for whom Islam is an object of fear and hostility, or by journalists who don't know any of the languages or relevant histories. I, I met, for example, a, a journalist who writes for the New York Times, Judith Miller, spent 20 years writing about Islamic fundamentalism in the Arab world, doesn't know a word of Arabic. It's uh, incredible. And, are, and people like that are content to rely on persistent stereotypes that have lingered in the West since the 10th century. Very little attention paid, for example, in the official U.S. media to what's going on in Iran today. 
Iran is in the throes of an enormous debate, stunningly energetic debate about law, freedom, personal responsibility, and tradition, all of it concerning Islam that is simply not covered by Western reporters. And of course, the scholars are worse than the reporters. And if you look at Islam in the Arab world, far from there being a surge of Islamic fundamentalism as it's reductively described in the Western media, there is a great deal of secular opposition to it, of, of which I count myself a member, in the form of various contests over the interpretation of sunnah and matters of law, personal conduct, political decision making, and so on. Moreover, what is often forgotten is that movements like Hamas and Islamic Jihad on the West Bank are essentially protest movements that go against the capitulationist politics of the PLO and mobilize the will to resist Israeli occupation practices, the expropriation of land, etc., etc., which still goes on even though there is this you know, wonderful peace process that we all feel so good about. So I find it surprising and indeed disquieting that Huntington gives no indication anywhere in his essay that he's aware of these disputes. Or that he realizes that the nature and identity of a civilization are never taken as unquestioned axioms by every single member of that civilization. Far from the Cold War being the defining horizon of the past few decades, I would say that it is this, this, this extremely widespread attitude of questioning and skepticism towards age-old authorities that characterizes the post-war world in both East and West. Nationalism and decolonization forced the issue by bringing whole populations to consider the question of nationality in the era after the white colonists have left. In Algeria, for example, today the site of a bloody contest between Islamists and aging and discredited government and military, the debate has taken violent forms. But it's a real debate and a fierce contest nonetheless over what is Algeria, what should it be? Having won from the French in 1962, the National Front for the Liberation of Algeria declared itself to be the bearer of a newly liberated Algerian, Arab, and Muslim identity. For the first time in the modern history of Algeria, Arabic became the language of instruction. State socialism became its, social, its political creed, non-alignment, its foreign affairs position. In the process of conducting itself as a one-party embodiment of all these things, the FLN grew into a massive, atrophied bureaucracy, its economy depleted, its leaders stagnating in the position of an unyielding oligarchy. Opposition arose not only from Muslim clerics and leaders, but from the Berber minority, submerged in the all-purpose discourse of a supposedly single Algerian identity. The political crisis of the past several years after the elections of 1991 represents a several-sided contest for power and for the right to decide the nature of Algerian identity. What is Islamic about it? What kind of Islam? What is national? What is Berber? What is Arab? And so on. That's what's at stake in Algeria. To Huntington, what he calls civilization identity is a stable and undisturbed thing like a room full of furniture in the back of your house. This is extremely far from the truth, not just in the Islamic world, but throughout the entire surface of the globe. To emphasize the differences between cultures and civilizations is completely to ignore the literally unending debate or contest about defining the culture of civilization within these civilizations, including several Western ones. These debates completely undermine any idea of a fixed identity. This is the point I'm getting to finally. That there is no such thing as a fixed identity which can be subsumed under labels like the West or the Slavs or the Japanese or the Africans, which Huntington considers to be a sort of ontological fact of political existence. You don't have to be an expert on China, Japan, India to know that. This is taking place everywhere. And we know it in our own experience in America. I, know, I talked about this a moment ago. Or there's the German case, in which a major debate has been taking place ever since the end of World War II about the nature of German civilization. 
as to whether Nazism derived logically from its core or whether it was an aberration. But there's more to the question of identity even than that. In the field of cultural and rhetorical studies, a series of recent advances and discoveries have given us a much clearer insight into not only the contested dynamic nature of cultural identity, but into the extent to which the very idea of identity itself involves fantasy, manipulation, invention, construction. If you look, for example, at Hayden White's book published in, uh, during the 1970s, called, the, the book was called Meta History, which is a study of several 19th century historians, Marx, Michelet, Nietzsche, and others. White makes the point, I think, beyond argument, that uh, these historians determine what history was by the kind of figures and language that they use, so that rhetoric determines the vision of history. So that Marx, as he writes, is committed to a poetics of irony, and this produces a particular historical vision. And the point of White's quite brilliant analysis is that he shows us how histories are best understood, not according to criteria of realness, but rather as to how their internal rhetorical and discursive strategies work. It is these rather than facts that make the visions of people like Tocqueville or Croce or Marx actually work as a system. The effect of White's book, as much as also the effect of Foucault's study, is to draw attention away from the existence of confirmations for ideas that might be provided by the natural world and focus it instead on the kind of language used which they've taught us to see as shaping the components of a writer's vision. Rather than the idea of class, for instance, deriving from a real class in the world, we would then come to see it as deriving instead from the strategies of Huntington's prose and his own interests which in turn relies on what I would call a managerial poetics, a strategy for assuming the existence of stable, metaphorically defined entities called civilizations, which the writer proceeds quite emotively to manipulate, as in the phrase from Huntington. Listen to this. The crescent-shaped Islamic bloc from the bulge of Africa to Central Asia has bloody borders. I'm not saying that Huntington's language is emotive and shouldn't be, but rather that quite revealingly it is the way all language functions in the poetic way analyzed by Hayden White. What is evident from Huntington's language is the way he uses figurative language to accentuate the difference between our world, normal, acceptable, familiar, logical, and as an especially striking example, the world of Islam with its bloody borders bulging contours, crescent shape, you know, all that suggests something really deeply disturbing. And that's what he's trying to do, make you afraid. This suggests not so much analysis on Huntington's part, but a series of determinations which create the very class he seems in his essay to be discovering and pointing to. Too much attention paid to managing and clarifying the class of culture obliterates the fact of a great, often silent, exchange and dialogue between them. What civilization today, whether Japanese, Western, European, Korean, Chinese, or Indian, has not had long, intimate, and extraordinarily rich contacts with other cultures, civilizations? There's no ex exception to this exchange at all. One would wish that conflict managers would have paid attention to and understood the meaning of the mingling of different musics in world music, in rock, for example, or in the work of high serious composers like Olivier Messiaen or Toro Takametsu, in which East and West blend together in music. Much the same is true of literature, where readers of Garcia Marquez, Nagib Mahfouz, Kenzaburo Owe, exist far beyond the boundaries imposed by language and action. There's a collective enterprise in culture which the people who proclaim the clash of civilization and cultures completely miss. One thinks of the lifelong dedication that has existed in all modern societies among scholars, artists, musicians, visionaries, and prophets to try to come to terms with the other. 
with that other society or culture that seems so foreign and so distant. One thinks of Joseph Needham, the great Cambridge chemist who spent his life studying China. Or in France, Louis Massignon, the great Orientalist, who did his own pilgrimage within the world of Islam. It seems to me that unless we emphasize and maximize the spirit of cooperation and humanistic exchange, and there's a collective enterprise in culture which the people who proclaim the clash of civilization and cultures completely miss. One thinks of the lifelong dedication that has existed in all modern societies among scholars, artists, musicians, visionaries, and prophets to try to come to terms with the other, with that other society or culture that seems so foreign and so distant. One thinks of Joseph Needham, the great Cambridge chemist who spent his life studying China. Or in France, Louis Massignon, the great Orientalist, who did his own pilgrimage within the world of Islam. It seems to me that unless we emphasize and maximize the spirit of cooperation and humanistic exchange, we're going to end up stridently and superficially banging the drum for our civilization in opposition to all the others. And it's also important to remember, to give one last example of how difficult it is in a simple way as Huntington does to talk about civilizations and traditions, for example. Think of this book by Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger called The Invention of Tradition. One of the newest fields in history is to study how traditions are invented, that they don't have the kind of long, hand, handed on sort of uh, existence that a lot of people think they do, but are made up the way when Queen Victoria goes to, or doesn't go actually, but is proclaimed Empress of India in 1872, uh, there was a whole series of ceremonies designed by the British in India to make it seem as if all British monarchs, stretching back to Queen Elizabeth, had always been emperors and empresses of India. The invention of a tradition. And this is partly what civilizations are, invented traditions. So that to conclude then, we have to look at this notion of clash as something constructed and something that needs to be critically de deconstructed in order for us to understand the complexities of the world in which we live. In other words, what I'm offering is not a prescription for simplicity, but really is a, a prescription for more complexity as more necessary to the world in which we live. But the truly weakest part, for my money, of the clash of civilizations idea is the rigid separation constantly assumed. Despite the overwhelming evidence that today's world is in fact a world of mixtures, migrations, crossing overs. One of the major crises affecting countries like Britain, France, about which I spoke a moment ago in the US has been brought about by the realization now dawning everywhere that no culture, society, civilization is purely one thing. Sizable minorities, North Africans in France, African, Caribbean, Indian populations in Britain, Asian and African elements in this country, these minorities dispute the idea that civilizations that prided themselves on being homogenous can continue to do so. There are no insulated cultures or civilizations. Any attempt made to separate them into watertight compartments alleged by Huntington does damage to their variety, their diversity, their sheer complexity of elements, their radical hybridity. What the clash of civilizations really overlooks though, and this is my final thought, is the phenomenon referred to as the globalization of capital. What has happened since the end of the Cold War has been an increasing polarization of the world, not into civilizations like Islam and so on and so forth, the West, Islam, Japan, but rather the world has now been divided into two vastly uneven regions, a small industrial north comprising the major American European and Asian economic powers, and an enormous South, 
comprising the former third world plus a large number of new extremely impoverished nations. The political problem of the future is going to be how to ma imagine their relationships as the North is going to get richer, the South poorer, and the world more interdependent. In view of this depressing and even alarming actuality, it does seem to be ostrich-like to suggest that in Europe and the US we should maintain our civilization by holding all the others at bay, increasing the rifts between peoples in order to prolong our dominance. That is in effect what Huntington is arguing. And one can quite easily understand why it is that his essay was published in Foreign Affairs and why so many policymakers have drifted toward it as allowing the US to extend the mindset of the Cold War into a different time for a new audience. Much more productive and useful is a new global mentality that sees the dangers we face from the standpoint of the whole human race. These dangers include the pauperization of most of the world's population, as in the North-South divide, the emergence of virulent local, national, ethnic, and religious sentiment, as in Bosnia, Rwanda, Lebanon, Israel, Chechnya, and elsewhere, the decline of literacy and the onset of a new illiteracy based on electronic modes of communication, television, and the new global information superhighway, the fragmentation and threatened disappearance of the grand narratives of emancipation and enlightenment. Our most precious asset in the face of such a drier, dire transformation of tradition and of history is the emergence of a sense of community, understanding and sympathy and hope, which is the direct opposite of what in his essay Huntington has provoked. Aimé Césaire says in his great poem, uh, The Return to the Native Land, no race possesses the monopoly of beauty, of intelligence, of force, and there is a place for all at the rendezvous of victory. In what they imply, these sentiments prepare the way for a dissolution of cultural barriers as well as of the civilizational pride that prevents the kind of benign globalism already to be found, for instance, in the environmental movement, in scientific cooperation, in the universal concern for human rights, in concepts of global thought that stress community and sharing over racial, gender, or class dominance. It would seem to me, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, that efforts to, to return the community of civilizations to a primitive stage of narcissistic struggle a la Huntington needs to be understood not as a description about how, in fact, civilizations behave, but rather as incitements to wasteful conflict and unedifying chauvinism. And that seems to be exactly what we do not need. Thank you. see because the lights are too strong. Is there a microphone somewhere? Yes, there you are. On behalf of the Distinguished Lecture Series Committee and the co-sponsors, I would like to thank Professor Edward Said for speaking this evening. Uh, there will be a 20-minute question and answer period with Professor Said right now. Members of the audience who wish to leave may do so now. We thank you for attending the lecture tonight. Those with questions for Professor Said may line up directly behind me. This is a forum for questions only. If you have a statement to speak, please address it in written form to the Distinguished Lecture Series in care of the Wisconsin Union Directorate. The address is found at the bottom of all the CRS literature. We begin now with the first question. Do the Israeli people who support the peace process do so because of the only because of the violence and chaos that affects their own lives or because they genuinely regret what happened to the Palestinian people and what is now happening? I can't really answer for the Israeli people, alas. Uh, um, I think uh, uh, I'm going to turn this question into an opportunity to beat the drum of what I was talking about this evening. 
to say that, you know, there's a lot of loose talk about Israel and uh, the Israeli people and so on and so forth, uh, especially in uh, the days after the Rabin uh, assassination. Uh, to talk about Israel as if it was one homogeneous thing, which it clearly isn't, uh, and to, to suggest that there is a kind of um, unanimity at work there. I think it's much better to talk about currents and conflicts within societies and, 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 uh, and cultures than to talk about them as monolithic things. I think it's quite clear uh, that there is inside Israel a conflict between two, um, shall we say, different conceptions of how Zionism's destiny is to be realized. On the one hand, you have the extreme right wing, uh, which produced the settler movements, which produced the, uh, the, the strange communities that, that produced, themselves produced Baruch Goldstein, who did the massacre of the Hebron Mosque in February of 1994, and the man who killed, uh, who assassinated Prime Minister Rabin. On the one hand, and these are the people who believe that the Bible gave uh, the whole land of Israel, every place, including Lebanon and uh, Syria and other places where there are, which are mentioned in the Old Testament, gave them to the Jewish people and they're entitled to have them all. And on the other side, there's the other aspect of Zionism, which you might call secular Zionism, represented by the Labour Party and most liberals in Israel who, said, who think that the, uh, that the, uh, that the that the, uh, that the destiny of Israel is to be realized by other means than messianic means of the sort employed by the settlers. And one of those means is, in my opinion, the, the, the peace agreement that was signed with the PLO. It was, a, I think, a Machiavellian document, a Machiavellian moment, seized by Perez and Rabin to... Uh, they found a demoralized and isolated leadership uh, Palestinian leadership, got them to sign an agreement which was not studied by lawyers or even by people who knew English on the Palestinian side. Uh, and what is, what is in place now, this so-called autonomy, uh, is in effect a, me a way of continuing the Israeli occupation of the West Bank of Gaza, in other words, asserting Israeli sovereignty over the whole of the land of historical Palestine, but doing it in a way that turns on the American media and says, oh, it's a great new moment of peace, it's, uh, you know, the handshake between Rabin and Arafat, and not looking at the situation on the ground, which allows the Israeli army to remain, redeployed, but remains nonetheless, um, and gives Israel the consent of the Palestinians to control the borders, to control sovereignty, to control the sea, to control the air, to control security, to control foreign affairs, and to do this all in the name of in the name of peace. Now there are other individuals in Israel, in, in, individuals I, I, I would like to, to mention, uh, people like Israel Shahak, for example, who's a, who's a great um, uh, Israeli citizen, uh, he's a survivor of the Holocaust, and he doesn't belong either to the Likud or the religious right or to the, to the Labour Party. Um, but he has always spoken out force, forcefully against the practices of Zionism against the Palestinians, and has denounced these subterfuges for what they are. But I think my impression, as speaking as a Palestinian, is that there still has been no recognition on the part of Israeli society. And it's very difficult for societies to make these recognitions, but they have existed. I mean, the Polish parliament apologized to the Jews for the Holocaust. The Japanese have been under pressure to apologize for what they did in Korea and, and China and uh, uh, elsewhere in Asia w uh, during their imperial dominance. And I think Palestinians require the same thing from Israelis, and that, uh, that change has not occurred. The acknowledgement that a grave injustice was committed against an entire people and an entire society. Uh, and for that you need the kind of leadership and uh, charismatic uh, vision that is very, very much lacking. So I see very little signs now that the peace process uh, on the ground has made any important 
radical change inside Israel. Uh, as many Israelis are happy to talk, I mean, everybody's happy about peace. I mean, I'm happy about peace. I love peace. I want peace. But there's, there are different kinds of pieces. There, there, we come, there we come to the question of definition again. It's not just the class of visions, but it's also how you define peace. And if you mean by peace, peace between equals, which is what I'm talking about. If you want to have a real peace between Israelis and Palestinians, it has to be between equals. It has to be between people who have the same rights as was achieved in South Africa, right? Rather than a peace, which is called a peace by the media, celebrated by Bill Clinton and others but in fact promotes the continuous subordination of the Palestinians and the denial of most of their rights. So I don't think the change has occurred in Israeli society. And I think that what we are watching is an extension of the policies of the last few years, given a new twist. When Professor Young introduced you, he said that you uh, supported, or either you're against the peace accords signed by the Labour government and the PLS on Liberation Organization. He also said they called you a humanist, and he said you criticized Jewish extremists for being against you, such as Kach, etc. However, in reality, you and the Palestine National Council, which calls for the destruction of violent destruction of Israel to this very day, you were actively taking... Well, what's your question? I mean, could you just ask the question? Well, my question is, how is that people call you... I, I consider you a terrorist. How is that they call you humanistic? Next question. I'm going to do something that I, uh, I, I normally detest, and that is I may be throwing you sort of a softball question here, but, um, but I, I watched uh, uh, Nightline last night. They had the, the, their uh, town meeting in Israel, and it seemed interesting that even those on the left, the uh, labor representatives on the panel, talked about preserving the Jewish character of Israel, even though beforehand someone had mentioned that 19% of the uh, Israeli citizens were Arabs, and I wondered if you saw, and not just to, uh, to reiterate the points that you've made in general about cultures, but uh, do you see any specific political mechanisms which might work in the future to, in a sense, enfranchise the Arabs as legitimate citizens of Israel? Oh no, they're, they're legitimate. That's a very good question. It's, it's not a softball at all, because, I mean, it, comes, it goes to the heart of the question. Oh, is, is this working? I, mean, I don't know. I thought I had a... What should I do here? <laughs> no, because this thing is... Well, anyway. uh, first of all, it, it, you're absolutely right that about 18 to 19 percent, we're, we're now talking here of about 900,000 people who are Israeli citizens, but are Palestinians, right? So they, they are, technically speaking, citizens of the, of the state of Israel, but they are designated in the, in the language of the state, juridically, as simply, not, not as Palestinians, but as non-Jews. I mean, Israel is a state for the Jewish people, wherever they may be. It's the only state of its kind in the world, by the way. It's not the state of its citizens, but the state of the Jewish people. And Palestinians, as a result, are really second-class citizens. I mean, juridically, second-class citizens. You understand, those are different from the Palestinians who live on the West Bank and Gaza. There are three groups of Palestinians today. The citizens of the state that I mentioned, the non-Jews, the citizens of the West Bank and Gaza who have no nationality at present at all, and the over 50% of the Palestinian population which exists in diaspora as stateless refugees for the most part, right? So the, the real struggle for Palestinians in this world is to find um, normalcy. In Israel, I think there has to be a battle on the part, not only of Palestinians, but also of Israeli Jews. First of all, to have a constitution. Israel doesn't have a constitution as a state. And to change the laws of the state, to permit the existence in the state of citizens who don't happen to be Jewish as full citizens. That is yet to occur. That's a democratic battle that has to be waged, not just by the minority Arabs, Palestinians, but by the Jewish majority as well. That's, very, that's a very important change to take place. And it's very much like the um, thing I was talking about in my talk, where we think of France as made up entirely of French people, or England as entirely of English people. Whereas in fact those states, 
like Israel, have very large minorities who don't happen to be English, French, and Israeli, or Jewish in this sense. So they're not homogenous. And a huge number of inequities occurs in the name of this homogenous idea, which is es essentially that the non majority, the minorities, whether they be called Palestinians or West Indians or Africans or North Africans in France, are treated as second, third, or fourth class citizens. They're suppressed. And it goes back, I think, to the idea that I was discussing here, that, that, that somehow this idea of civilization and culture ought to be homogenous, is, is what is prevailing. So that if you, you have the idea that, for example, Israel is a Jewish state, if there are non-Jews there, they have to be treated as third class citizens, by law. And that's why I'm against these ideas of, uh, uh, of, uh, of civilizational homogeneity, because it not only implies the kind of suppression that I, meant, that I mentioned, but it also creates hostility between us, the majority, and them. And that is the kind of thinking I think needs to be dismantled forthwith. It's, it's terribly important. So do you see anything that might bring about perhaps, I, I guess that you see the only way to do that is to have a serious popular movement yes. on the part of Jews. Do you see um, yes. any, any signs no, of that? No, I don't. I don't see any sign of it at all because, uh, because unfortunately, um, you know, there was an interesting, well, I don't want to go into this, too complicated and, 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 and uh, time-consuming a subject, but I think that the, the main problem now uh, inside Israel is not the definition of what is a religious Jew, because religious Jews know who they are, and for them Israel ought to be X and Y and Z. But the problem is for the majority of Israeli Jews who are secular Jews. And there, the question of what is the identity, the civilizational identity, the cultural identity of the country in a place that is surrounded by uh, Million, hundreds of millions of, of Muslim Arabs is a very difficult problem to solve. Uh, and I think there the question of thinking about identity and, and of relating one identity to the other is, is an extremely complex one and it's being put off. Why? Well, you see it in the accents of the, of the leadership of, the, of, the, uh, of Israel today. They talk mainly about security. Uh, and it, security means insecurity. And very little attention is paid to the fact that, uh, that, that, that Israel has been, for, for years, at least from the point of view of Arabs, a major source of insecurity for them. So this, this hostility, this cultural hostility which exists between these groups, has to abate. And my critique of the, uh, of the current peace process, as it's called, is that it's, this is not a way of abating it, it's a way of simply deferring it for, uh, for, some, for some length of time. But I think the problems will stay there. Because it's very difficult for Palestinians, for example, to accept the position forever of being second class citizens. 